Thank you. It's lovely to be home. So, problems are bullies. Mm. When you run away from them, they tend to chase you down and beat you. But when you turn on them, something very different happens. So my grandparents, great-grandparents in fact, Sholem and Sarah Peel, lived in Lithuania. They adored one another, as you can see by the number of children. <laughs> that happens to be my grandfather inside my great-grandmother's belly at the time. And because they were living in Lithuania, and because they were Jewish, they were unable to send their children to university. And so being a bright family, they got on a boat, not speaking a word of English, and arrived in Port Elizabeth. It wasn't Krabecha back then. And my grandfather, 16 years later, matriculated from Gray, and he got on a boat and he sailed off to the UK and came back seven years later. There was no FaceTime in those days as a dental surgeon and a maxillofacial surgeon. And he was taken to the South African Medical and Dental Council because he brought in these un this unnecessary machine in order to fleece his customers, his patients, called dental x-rays. Well, needless to say, he won that case. When they arrived in South Africa, because their surname was Pill, it was another problem. Because Pill, as some of you might know, is Afrikaans for penis, which wouldn't be a great start to a new career in South Africa. And so the South African authorities gave them the great surname of Pearl, which sounds much fancier. My great-grandmother and grandmother had a problem because they were in Lomza, Poland. And similarly, because they were Jewish, they were unable to get an education there. My great-grandfather was a baker. And so in 1932, they got onto a boat and they came to South Africa as well. Um, and the family that didn't come all perished in the Holocaust, tragically. And they started a department store in Nelson Mandela Bay called Colnix. For some of the older people in the room, you're all very young, you won't remember that. <laughs> but a lot of innovation. And then I had a problem that is indeed me, and I did once have hair. <laughs> and um, I didn't know what to do, uh, what to study, what to become. And so I thought I'd become a maxillofacial surgeon, dentist like my grandfather, until my best friend turned to me and he said, do you really want to look into other people's mouths for the rest of your life? <laughs> and being a self-confessed germaphobe, it was the first time I ever thought about plaque halitosis saliva rather than being called doctor and living in a lovely home. And so I joined Nelson Mandela University to study architecture until I got this big fat book called The Fundamentals of Plumbing. And I thought, what the hell is this? Um, because I thought I was going to design the Guggenheim. And so I dropped out of that and I went to see the registrar of the university and I said, I don't want to do this. So he chatted a bit and he said, how about doing psychology? I think you'd be good at that. So uh, I decided to enroll for psychology midway through the year and my same pesky best friend said to me, so do you really want to sit in a room for the rest of your life and listen to other people's problems? So at the end of the year, I got my credits, I didn't know what to do, and then uh, I had a conversation again with the registrar, and then, da da discovered the bright lights of commercial psychology, marketing and communications, the art of persuasion. And that is what we're going to talk about today, in terms of leaning into problems and thinking of innovative solutions around it. Now, I am hardwired in such a way that I have no patience whatsoever for negativity. If I saw a positive outcome from wallowing in self-misery or negativity, I might do that. But nothing positive comes out of negativity, so there's no point thinking about it. I also love problems, because without problems, there is no opportunity. All opportunity is born out of problems, and without opportunity, there is no innovation. So these are things that we should embrace. So if you look at these countries over here, um, they've all embraced innovation from their problems. Dubai understood that there was a limited lifespan for uh, fuel. And so they looked at their geographic location. They had a lot of money as a place, as a territory. And as you know, they became a tourism and travel hub. 
Israel has absolutely no water. So embracing that, they developed hydroponic farming, drip systems, and second to Palo Alto is the number one, number two tech um, destination in the world. Singapore in the last 25 years, we all know that story. A very clear plan, a very clear strategy, and meticulous implementation. So we can't do anything about South Africa in terms of where we have been. Where we have been, as you said, we're a struggling birth of a new democracy. But today, what we can determine for the next 25 years might make us a Singapore. So let's think about that. So this is where we are. Nelson Mandela Bay, Kwaberga, Port Elizabeth, whatever you choose to call it. And when you land here, an interesting thing happens at David Stuerman Airport. You see billboards of cars, brake pads, tires, shock absorbers, windscreens, because 100 years ago, somebody said, let's make cars here. But 100 years later, what is the idea for Nelson Mandela Bay? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about other countries and come right back here. So um, Jörg Utzen, the Scandinavian architect who designed the Sydney Opera House, wasn't even invited to the opening of this ugly building. <laughs> Today it's gone on to be one of the global icons of the world. Gustav Eiffel, who designed the Eiffel Tower in the late 1800s, was a railroad engineer. And if you look at the Eiffel Tower, all it is is a railroad going up into the sky. Pretty much. The French were horrified by this at the time. I mean, the French are mostly horrified by anything on any given day. <laughs> uh, and now it is a symbol of Parisian ooh-la-la. Everyone loves the Eiffel Tower. And then there's an industrial port, very much like Nelson Mandela Bay, called Bilbao in Spain. And what they decided to do to turn the fortunes of the city around was to get the most famous architect in the world, Frank Gehry, to design the Guggenheim, Bilbao. And today it's moved from being industrial city to being cultural center in Spain and in Europe. So what is the opportunity? Well, opportunities are born out of an enemy. So if you had to say to Phil Knight, the creator of Nike, the founder, who is the enemy of Nike? He will not say Adidas or Reebok or Puma. He'll say apathy. Because he knows if he can get more people off the couch and moving, he can sell more sneakers. So who is the enemy of Nelson Mandela Bay, seeing as we are here today? What is the problem? And because I come from here, I can say this. Low self-belief. This is a city where the citizenry don't believe in their potential and aren't harnessing the assets of where we live. So a few years ago, in 2018, there was a competition to build a statue of Madiba or a structure for Madiba. And I looked at this thing with my team, now my sheikh and a couple of my partners, and we thought, if we don't get involved, heaven knows what the city might build. So we need to get involved. <laughs> and we also thought, um, we can't have something that is about Madiba himself, Nelson Mandela, the most famous statesperson that ever lived. We need to have something that is emblematic of him and his values, the ability to instill hopes and dreams and potential into people. And so we created this. Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another. The story of Nelson Mandela is not only a story of one man. It is a story of a collective sacrifice by a nation on its long, difficult walk towards freedom. It is a story of hope, a call to all of us to seek the light within, a light that may lead us towards a better tomorrow. The Nelson Mandela Tower of Light is an embodiment of this spirit. With 27 flights of stairs for every year Matiba spent in prison, we recreate this rite of passage with a beacon of light that stands 27 stories high. This vertical journey leads visitors to three destinations. A pre-prison section where the visitor can learn about the friends that influenced the man who would become the symbol of hope for the entire world. Further up the stairs is a section which marks the second stage of imprisonment. This is a silent section, representing the band voice of the people's leader. A silence which creates the feeling of solitude that he experienced in confinement. 
The last section, the pinnacle of the structure, is at 81 meters above the ground. It is here, on the top floor, that the spirit of freedom is captured in a space of reflection. The journey upwards is also a sonic experience. The visitor is greeted by the sounds of Kunu, snippets from the Rivonia trial, Matiba's anecdotes and speeches to the nation as the visitor ascends towards the light. Our logo takes its design cues from the stairs that symbolize the icon's long walk to freedom and patterns that evoke the African spirit. This logo is a fitting iconography for Madiba, the son of the soil who would become the light of the world. So welcome to the Nelson Mandela Tower of Light, the first step towards a brighter future for the people of Nelson Mandela Bay, for our country and the world. So what you can see over there is it's a magnificent structure. If I had more time than 18 minutes, I'd show you the whole video. Um, but what people don't realize, because the city has decided to build it at St. George's Park, and people say to me, but Mike, why would you build it at St. George's Park when it's a crime-infested area? And my answer is, well, that's precisely why you'd build it at St. George's Park, because that's how Velvet Revolution starts. That's how you gentrify a city. What people don't realize is right next to where they want to build the Nelson Mandela Tower of Light is an empty and derelict canteen and an empty swimming pool that is lying in, uh, in disrepair. That canteen is where the world-famous playwright Athel Fugard grew up, and he wrote Master Harold and the Boys, based on the racial tension and the inequality of apartheid, right there. That should be the most famous canteen in this country. It should be a center for reconciliation, for discussion, for hospitality. Master Harold and the Boys, which became a Hollywood movie starting, starring Matthew Broderick, also starred John Carney, who happens to come from the city and is one of our most famous actors. And right next to this is an empty, empty amphitheater, which at the moment is used every now and then for a Shakespearean play. This should be the John Carney Theatre, and it should be a celebration of African creativity. So all of a sudden, within a little triangle, you see the Nelson Mandela Tower of Light, you see the Ethel Fugard Canteen, and you see the John Carney Theatre. A totally different situation to the derelict site that's crime infested there right now. People call uh, the city the Windy City. We heard about it as you were flying in yesterday. Now, Cape Town is more windy than PE. We called the Windy City because Cape Town named us the Windy City so that they weren't called the Windy City. <laughs> but they're much cleverer than we are because they call the wind there the Cape Doctor because it blows away the pollution. This is what a city looks like when it's not a windy city. This is the smog. So if we lean into the problem of being the Windy City, well, we become leaders in green energy. What we become is a destination for um, kart surfing and regattas and sailing, just like Cape Town has done over there. If you look on the highway, we've got all of these derelict old buildings filled with slumlords. Um, and if we didn't have these derelict buildings, we couldn't do what they've done at the favelas in South America, in Brazil, or in Miami, because I say that we should take those derelict buildings and create the largest and most beautiful uh, graffiti wall in the world that people come and visit. And imagine what you could do with something like that. Lean into your problems. Four hours outside of Johannesburg, or five hours drive, is the Kruger National Park. And they've got some elephants over there. Um, just 40 minutes outside Nelson Mandela Bay is the Addo Elephant Park, and the largest malaria-free Big Seven area on planet Earth. That is a natural asset that should make this one of the most famous destinations on planet Earth. But if you ask people in Nelson Mandela Bay, are you aware that you are the gateway to the malaria free Big Seven? Nobody thinks about it, 40 minutes away. And yet Joburg, they think they're the hub uh, because they are four hours away. And so when you arrive at our airport here, our airport should be a BOMA. It should be like arriving at a game reserve, not arriving at an industrial city that makes cars. And the other thing that we've got above the Kruger National Park is we don't have the Anopheles mosquito. There is no malaria. Now, that is completely unique. 20 minutes outside of that area 
is the new deep sea harbor, Kucha. And this harbor is used uh, for transporting vehicles and for export. This harbor could be used for cruises, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, particularly Disney. Imagine if Disney cruises came here. Now, we live in the experience economy today, which means that people actually want to feel things and do things, not just watch things. Now, imagine if Disney got behind putting these different game farms together in this area. And instead of experiencing Pumbaa and Timon and Simba and Dumbo as cartoon drawings, people could come here and experience them through Disneyland Africa as real animals. Now, if Disneyland were here and the cruise ships were arriving, the number one challenge for this area is inequality and unemployment. And if we had to do something like that, this silver bullet over here, right here, could solve all of that in terms of farming, hospitality industry, job creation, investment, and become a world-famous destination. So just in a few minutes, hopefully what I've demonstrated to you is that by leaning into your problems, you can unlock a bright future. Run away from them, you're not going to make any progress at all. So thank you very much for having me today. I think the opportunities are to be found always in the problems. There is no, no, no opportunity to be found in success. <coughs> in success. Other people's successes are meaningless. Lean and look into the problem. What are we waiting for? Thank you very much.